you gotta appreciate groupthink before you can deal with it. Hey, I am Chuck the Bureaucrat, and I want to start today's conversation on how to combat groupthink by taking a moment and celebrating groupthink. The way I see it, groupthink kind of gets a bad rap. Groupthink is this psychological phenomenon where the members of a group will prioritize harmony and conformance and consensus within the group, so much so that they'll lead themselves to irrational or dysfunctional decisions. According to researchers, symptoms associated with groupthink are an overestimation of the abilities of the group, a push towards conformity, and closed-mindedness. See what I mean about a bad rap? It's all negative connotations. But I've said before, and I stand by it, that human beings evolved to live in groups of 60 to 80 individuals where there was a roughly equal mix of both genders and that we were distributed by different ages. We did not evolve to survive as individuals like some solitary predatory animal that abandons its young at birth. We evolved as groups. And when researchers talk about evolved traits, they have this word they use called adaptive. That means that the trait, even though it may not benefit the individual, has some positive effect on the survival of the group. Anytime I see a behavior that is common or repeated across lots and lots of different groups, I start to ask myself, what advantage does it serve? In that light, groupthink seems like a pretty advantageous feature. In fact, researchers have noticed that groupthink becomes very common when the group faces highly stressful external threats. It's also common when there have been recent failures, there's difficult decision-making tasks, or serious time pressures. I mean, <laughs> those seem like the kinds of situations where you need rapid consensus and similar behavior. I mean, it is not time to form a debate team when the barbarians are at the gate. Speaking of military scenarios, another feature of the groupthink literature that, that seems to get in the way of understanding it and using it properly is that it tends to focus on situations of military failure. The Bay of Pigs invasion or the Japanese decision to bomb Pearl Harbor. You see how the researchers focus on the negative things? I mean, I kind of have this feeling that lots of soldiers have come back from combat specifically because of groupthink. In fact, the Vietnam POWs come to mind when I think about this, and almost any battle drill. So I think that on balance, groupthink is a good thing, but that doesn't mean it won't produce some undesirable outcomes. It just means that Dealing with groupthink starts by understanding when it's useful and when it's not. And as far as being successful in the Pentagon and avoiding the, the negative consequences of groupthink, it means tuning in to three things. Difficult decisions when there are no good solutions, high stress, and extreme time constraints. That's why I say there are no new questions and nothing is a crisis. The first step is just to avoid getting personally caught up in the panic of the moment. And the big thing that you want to avoid in these high-stress moments is the silencing of dissent. When your group is under pressure, you want the right degree of dissent. Enough so that you don't make bad decisions, but not so much that it throws a wrench into the works. Now, some of you are already thinking about the devil's advocate, and yeah, that's where I'm headed, but this comes with a huge warning label. It is not constructive for some random member of the group to suddenly decide that they are going to play the devil's advocate. I mean, usually, any group of Pentagon bureaucrats is really made up of representatives from a whole bunch of sub-organizations that have their own competing goals and desires. In a crucial moment, it's not hard for one of those sub-organizations to throw up a ridiculous barrier and then just whitewash it by saying, well, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here. 
This kind of behavior is one of the reasons that big decisions get made in small rooms. People who are barriers to decisions have to be excluded. But there is a right way to get the benefits of the devil's advocate. And to understand this, we've got to take a look at the origin of the term. Up until the 1980s, the Catholic Church had an official position that was called the protector of the faith. This person's job was to argue against a candidate for sainthood. You know, poke holes in a person's character, question the evidence, and basically argue that any of the miracles, they weren't really miracles. So a couple of things here. The protector of the faith was specifically trained, selected, and appointed. The guy who's playing the devil's advocate, he is none of these. So one of the ways to combat groupthink is to appoint your own protector of the force or speaker for the soldiers. And there's a particular quality that I like in a protector. I like somebody who is no longer going to get promoted. Someone who knows that their OERs no longer matter. And so they're not worried about the consequences of the opinion that they would voice. Another similar technique to avoid groupthink is what I like to call the League of Disgruntled Specialists. You see, there is a very special and valuable kind of soldier that is almost always available in large quantities. These are E4s who are not staying in the Army. They've usually come to the conclusion that the Army is full of shit and they're not interested in being part of it anymore. They often have some kind of personal grievance with the leadership. And in a lot of cases, they are obnoxiously outspoken about it. As a result, they tend to get ignored by the higher ups. I argue that there are specific situations where ignoring these voices seriously contributes to groupthink. See, one of the causes of groupthink is high group cohesiveness. The more tightly committed individuals are to the goals of the group, the less likely they are to dissent. This league of disgruntled specialists, well, they're not a small group, and they represent a lot of the dissent within the military. So the fact that leadership ignores them can become problematic. Granted, maybe it doesn't matter that the major writing the battalion op order doesn't listen to the disgruntled specialists about where to put the fuel stops for the convoy. But there are definitely some decisions that benefit from their input. A big one is with recruiting material. I mean, you got to remember that these guys are soon going to be back out in the civilian population. If you're launching a new recruiting campaign, these characters are going to be the ones who are shaping the public's perception of that campaign. If they think that the campaign is stupid, inauthentic, or easily mocked, they are going to undermine the success of that message. Kind of the same thing with retention efforts. Positive feedback from people who are going to stay already it doesn't mean anything. But feedback from the League of Disgruntled Specialists, it's likely to highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of your plan. Another technique for getting genuine feedback on a plan is what I call a Persian. Allegedly, the Persian army would consider war plans while sober and then reconsider them once everybody got good and drunk. The idea was that people are more likely to speak their mind after they've been drinking and alcohol provides a convenient excuse if they accidentally cause offense. Of course, the modern military can't do this on the battlefield, but I think it's important to remember that a good plan is a good plan sober and drunk. A good plan looks good under different states of mind, so seek out ways that you can consider a plan under different lighting. Final thing is, did you notice how all of these options that I suggested had to do with getting dissent into the open, making dissent part of the decision-making process? Well, I'm going to mention one last technique for getting genuine feedback. Have private, informal conversations with individual members of the group. The more informal, the better. People feel uncomfortable going against the group publicly. I have seen plenty of senior leaders get 
cornered into publicly agreeing to a plan that they had serious misgivings about. If you see this happening, recognize that it is a tactic of relatively weak leaders and it's the thing that drives the group towards bad decisions. And what's more, the individuals who get cornered are usually targeted because they're susceptible to this sort of group pressure. This means that you may have to figure out what the legitimate concerns are and get them into the discussion. Not freaking easy, but if you're going to combat the negative effects of groupthink, you're going to have to start by recognizing it within yourself. Now, if you want to see an example where, in my opinion, groupthink doomed the army to frustration, watch this video about the combat fitness test.